Hello, my beautiful and courageous friends. It's Natalie here, and I'm here today with Nora Gedgaudis, who's a board-certified nutritional consultant and a neurofeedback specialist from Portland, Oregon. When the waves came and when the storm raged, found myself falling into the ground. When the wind blew, that's when it fell through, and I don't know how to turn it around. I know there's more to me than the record you see. We're so honored to have Nora here today, who's got a wealth of information about nutrition and the brain. And um, Nora's also the author of the international bestseller, Primal Body, Primal Mind, Beyond the Paleo Diet, and um, the book Rethinking Fatigue. So thank you so much for being with us today, Nora. It's my pleasure. On this hot day here at Shelburne It Farms. is, it is. It's uh, very tropical here in Vermont today. <laughs> it's a tropical <laughs> <Yeah>. moment. <laughs> So, Nora, I want to talk to you first about nutrition for people with brain injuries. Yeah. And I'm wondering how much of a difference does nutrition make for people with a brain injury? Is it a slight difference over a long period of time, or is it a significant immediate impact or somewhere in the middle there? Well, I think it's a make or break difference, really. With a head injury, you're in a position of really not having a lot of wiggle room, you know, mm -hmm. with what you need to do in order to be even close to functioning well, much less optimally functioning. So nutrition is going to be huge for you in terms of helping you to control uh, neuroinflammation, which is a constant battle for people with traumatic brain injury, um, as well as maintaining healthy levels of neurotransmitters and, uh, and, and things like that. Everything that we experience in life, everything that our brain runs on, is dependent on the nutrients that we supply it with in order to in, in order to do that the quality or lack of thereof of those of those nutrients uh, or or non-nutrients as it might be uh, can totally make or break how you feel and function in everyday life this is true for everyone not just for people with traumatic brain injury but it's especially true for people with traumatic brain injury it's a big deal it is a big deal because we need all the help we can get absolutely just to get through the day yep there's also an issue with traumatic brain injury of, of being more prone to instability. And there are things that can support your brain stability and there are things that are going to um, strongly challenge your brain's capacity for stability and you know, nutritionally. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a big deal. So what kind of things should a person with a brain injury avoid and not be eating, first of all? Right. Well, there's nothing more destabilizing to a brain than basically dysglycemia, than, than blood sugar problems, right? Mm -hmm. Dietary sugar and starch causing your blood sugar to shoot up and then insulin driving that back down and that, you know, that roller coaster that kind of ensues. And if you ever were prone to dysglycemia before the head injury, you know, you, you might find, as with almost anything that is problematic before the head injury occurred, you know, a head injury is going to shove you off whatever cliff you happen to be standing next to. It can be that much worse. So minimizing the amount of sugar and starch in your diet is going to be really important. Also, anything that is prone to generating uh, brain inflammation or possible immune reactivity. You know, there are certain foods that can qualify as dietary antigens, things that activate your immune system and create inflammation. Uh, can be a potential problem. Now, the biggest offender in this regard is gluten, you know, the, the protein found in, in grains. But also, uh, there are proteins in dairy products that oftentimes also have that triggering effect, and in various legumes, you know, beans and, and things like soy and, and whatever else can also be highly problematic for a lot of people. Now, dairy and soy aren't necessarily problematic for everyone. You want to possibly get some quality immunologic testing. There's a laboratory called Cyrix Labs, and I always recommend them uh, head and shoulders above all the rest because they have the, at by far the most accurate and comprehensive testing that is most likely to give you an accurate result of any other testing available anywhere in the world and you really need the most accurate result for something like that you can get. So you need to find a practitioner 
that is able to offer you that, to help you kind of better identify what kinds of things might trigger you into states of greater instability and inflammation. What kind of practitioner would have access to this lab and those kind of tests? Well, almost any licensed healthcare provider. Um, you know, you, I think you're a little more likely to find people with Cyrex accounts that are operating in natural healthcare fields, but there are increasingly neurologists and, and general practitioners and um, that are also using Cyrex labs as a way of better identifying these problems. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they truly are the gold standard in identifying these problems. Mm -hmm. It's just that most mainstream uh, medical practitioners don't think about food. They think about pharmaceuticals and surgery and, you know, these sort of expensive medical procedures first because that is the nature of that industry. And the, and the problem that you're referring to is primarily the inflammation that's being caused by wheat and sugar Yes. Soy and dairy. Yes. So it's a matter of being tested for these things to know which things are triggering you. Right. But I would say that even that uh, gluten-containing grains in general are going to be uh, likely to be destabilizing, just simply by virtue of the fact that even if you don't have an immune reactivity to them, uh, for starters, they're starch-based food <laughs> primarily, and starch is, is going to mess with your blood sugar. But they also, they stimulate the release of an enzyme called zonulin. And no, that's not from a Star Trek movie. Um, zonulin? But zonulin, yes. Zonulin. And zonulin basically controls intestinal permeability, but also blood-brain barrier permeability. When those things are compromised, it can allow substances that were never meant to be in your bloodstream or in your brain, you know, get through there and cause you uh, inflammatory reactions. And even if you're not reacting directly to the gluten in the wheat, rye, or barley, or oats, or, or wherever it might happen to be, uh, it can still make you more vulnerable to developing other sensitivities to other foods and also other any other kind of substance that you might happen to you know, come into you know, digestive contact with. Mm -hmm. So um, these are things that need to be kind of you know, taken into account. I think the, the, the antigenic issue is really important. It's so roughly half of everyone with a gluten sensitivity or gluten immune reactivity, whether it's celiac disease based or some other form of gluten immune reactivity, only 12% of gluten immune reactivity is actually celiac based. But the primary impact of gluten has actually not been found to be on the gut in recent years, but actually been found to be on the brain. And roughly half of everyone with a glutamine reactivity is actually also producing neurological antibodies. In other words, antibodies against your own brain and nervous system tissue in some way that can further lead to neuroinflammation and, and neurodegeneration, something that you can ill afford right. You know, right. with this kind of a thing. So blood sugar surges are not your friend. And these are created by eating sugar or eating carbohydrates that quickly turn into sugars. Yes. Yes, starch. I mean, a, you you create a bigger uh, blood sugar surge with with cereal or with white potatoes than you would with the candy bar, even. Wow. So those things are very very glycemic. But you have to worry a little bit about some things that are that that they claim are low glycemic things that are very high in fructose, for instance. Everything from fruit juices to things like agave syrup and things containing high fructose corn syrup, they don't necessarily evoke. A glycemic response, in other words, trigger insulin right away. But what they do is they damage your brain very directly through a process called glycation. And glycation is a process whereby sugars will combine with proteins and fats in your brain and cause them to become sticky and misshapen and start to malfunction. Now, things like Alzheimer's disease are being increasingly seen as, as uh, and defined as type 3 diabetes, basically a form of brain neuropathy um, developed through uh, extended periods of time with even, uh, you know, with, with elevated blood sugar due to a diet that's high in sugars and starches. You know, sugar is ultimately always neurodegenerative. It's just that it can have that effect in a much, at a much more accelerated pace with somebody whose brain is already vulnerable, right? You don't have that wiggle room that the average person might have, and I don't actually think 
many average people have that much wiggle room nowadays either. Right, right. Everybody's struggling with one brain function or another. Yeah, everybody's struggling with something. So would somebody with a traumatic brain injury inherently have inflammation in the brain yes. kind of all the time that they're dealing with? Yeah, that's one of the... So you don't want to exacerbate that? Right, right. So you, okay. Yeah. So your, your number one enemy is always going to be that inflammatory response. And, you know, elsewhere in the body, on the other side of the blood-brain barrier, we have our peripheral immune system that has little checks and balances that will help to kind of calm the inflammation down once the threat has passed, once the immediate threat has passed. But on the other side of the blood-brain barrier, the microglial cells, the glial and microglial cells of the brain, which are your brain's immune system, effectively, they don't have an off switch. They're sort of like nervous little chihuahuas all holding AK-47s, you know, <laughs> waiting for the sh next shoe to drop, and then suddenly something triggers them into, you know, into being active, and, you know, one little chihuahua starts yipping and firing off its AK-47, next thing you know, they're all firing off in all directions. And what you basically, what, th what that's representing is a lot of active damage. Mm -hmm. And that reactivity can keep going for long periods of time. Another image would be a little bit like, imagine a whole football field filled with, with, uh, with mouse traps, all just sort of ready to be sprung. And then somebody takes a little weighted ping pong ball or a handful of those and, and tosses them in, and immediately it sets off a chain reaction where suddenly these things are firing off in all directions, and it becomes a self-perpetuating pattern that, again, uh, may not stop until a whole lot of damage has been done. And so anything that's neuroinflammatory can, can persist and rage on for days, weeks, months, years, even decades for some people. So including you have, these foods that we were talking including about. these foods, which are going to only add to the problem. So by adopting a diet that isn't so reliant on sugar as a primary source of fuel, but instead adapts your brain to a dependence on something called ketones, which are the energy units of fat as a primary source of fuel, there is literally nothing more stabilizing to a brain and nervous system than that. You know, every person watching this, no matter how slender they are has sufficient fat to go for, you know, almost a period of weeks, you know, with, with just that fuel. But we don't really store more than a couple thousand calories of glycogen, you know, which are like long strings of glucose molecules in our muscles and in our liver at any given time. Um, and so that limits it, which means it has to be constantly replenished. And your body is more or less obsessed with maintaining the lowest level of blood sugar it needs to at any given time because sugar is so inherently damaging to all tissues, but especially the brain. And so your body's constantly struggling to try to keep excess blood sugar down, but if you're dependent on sugar as a primary source of fuel, you're constantly working to replenish that throughout the day. And many people do that by eating foods that cause it to spike. And then you end up with this kind of a pattern. Yeah that up and down pattern. You because over you go through it so fast, it's like the kindling you, metaphor that yeah. you were using. Right. The sugar being kindling and the fats being more like the logs on the fire that right. are going to be sustaining. Right. And 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 that's just it. You know, that's an analogy I like to use. That carbohydrates are basically the, the metabolic equivalent of kindling uh, on your metabolic fires. Your so called complex carbs, the you know, brown beans and whole grain rice and you know other you know whole grain breads and you know, whatever have you, um, sweet potatoes, are, are a little bit like taking twigs and throwing those on the metabolic fire. Uh, but things like white rice, white potatoes, uh, bread, pasta, are a little bit more like throwing crumpled up paper on that metabolic fire. And then you take alcohol, you take sweetened beverages, you know, sodas or uh, sports drinks or whatever, and that's a little bit more like throwing lighter fluid or gasoline on that metabolic fire. And if all you had was kindling to run your wood stove all day long, you could do that, but you would be a slave to that wood stove. You'd be constantly preoccupied with where the next handful of fuel was coming from to keep that fire going. Which is why we sometimes tend to eat sugar all day long with right. a brain injury, because our fatigue is set in. So where's the next cookie? Exactly, exactly. It, it becomes kind of a self-perpetuating issue. The reason you crave sugar is because you're metabolically dependent on that substance as your primary source of fuel. And when you 
have had something like a head injury, you're in an inherently unstable state anyway. You're less likely to have healthy, stable blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So it's a constant battle to try to stay on top of that. I think of it as an enslavement of sorts, um, because if you're not on top of it all the time, things get ugly, you know? You end up with mood swings, you end up feeling crabby or brain fogged or fatigued. Um, sometimes I say something that rhymes with itchy. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it could be any, any number of, of adverse symptoms. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that that's not the normal way to feel in between meals. All of those things that I just mentioned are signs that you have a problem with blood sugar. The way you're supposed to feel when you haven't eaten for a while, you know, what's natural is, is to feel hungry. That's the way you're supposed to feel. And once you've eaten the meal, what you're supposed to feel is not hungry. And uh, if it's anything else, it's not normal. And, and it's not normal just because it's common, right? So getting your blood sugar under control is a critical first step. Now, in a conventional nutritionist would tell you, well, eat a big breakfast and eat every two hours and keep snacks with you all the time or whatever else, because you're it's basically feeding more kindling into the metabolic wood stove. And that's one way of doing it, but you're also adding more glycation to your system. You're also adding more potential neurodegenerative and inflammatory uh, things into your system. So what is the alternative to that? Well, what if you were to take a nice big fat log instead and throw that on the fire? Suddenly now, um, with, with the addition of dietary fat in a way, in the absence of sugar, that makes fat your primary source of fuel, um, you have a fuel source that is going to be much more even burning, that is going to burn much longer, that doesn't need constant replenishment, and is going to leave you with a great deal more stability. Many people are familiar with the use of what are called ketogenic diets in the treatment of epilepsy, for instance, which is just another form of neurological instability. Mm -hmm. The thing is, one, one of the things that we've learned in the field of neurofeedback, of which I'm a part, is that we're able to take similar approaches to all forms of neurological instability, whether they be seizures or panic attacks or uh, the instabilities associated with traumatic brain injury, um, blood sugar swings, all those kinds of things, and take fairly, again, fairly similar approaches to, to those different problems and, you know, achieve, you know, good to excellent results. Well, the same thing is true of dietarily, that a ketogenic state is inherently and universally much more stabilizing to the body and brain. And just to put it in simple layman's terms for those of us who have a hard time with abstract concepts, sure. yes. a ketogenic diet is one that's based upon the fat, right. the logs on the fire, right. rather than the sugars and carbohydrates, right. the kindlings on and the fire. And it's the logs on the fire in the absence of the kindling, right? In other words, you're not ke you can't um, like have the baked potato and the big butter, big pat of butter, both. That's not going to be the stabilizing thing. Mm -hmm more stabilizing, I guess, than the baked potato by itself. But ultimately what you want is to be giving your body healthy, natural sources of dietary fat, you know, from, from cleanly raised, uh, pastured, fully pastured animals, and from things like organic olive oil and coconut oil is wonderful, you know, just Avocados. naturally uh, seafood, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of a thing. You know, do that, but not, you, you can't have that and have the sugar too. That, the problems associated with fat are not with fat in and of itself, but fat in the presence of high carbohydrate. And the two together are not good. But fat in the absence of carbohydrate has a very different effect than fat in the presence of carbohydrate, uh -huh. sugar and starch carbohydrate. Well, it's interesting because after my injury, because I was laying on the couch all day, I, I really didn't want to gain weight. It was the one thing that I wanted to have some semblance of control over. Sure. So I just gave up eating all fats. Uh huh. So there's this big myth out there. Right. That we're now correcting. That fat makes you fat. That fat will it make doesn't. you fat. It doesn't. Yeah. So Basically, the fat, the, the fat storage hormone is insulin, and insulin is more uh, likely to be provoked by dietary carbohydrate. You know, insulin is. Is, it's basically about taking excess nutrients and moving them into storage in case of a famine. It, it's all about the coordination of your energy stores with reproduction and lifespan, really. It's not a blood sugar hormone, per se. We use fat for an enormous variety of things in the human body. 
your brain and nervous system are roughly 80% fat by dry weight. And you make your hormones and neurotransmitters you know, rely upon fat and the receptor sites rely upon things like fat and cholesterol in order to work properly. Dietary fat is also, you know, just it's very important for, for structure, right? For the, for the formation of every single one of your cell membranes are basically made up of, of phospholipids, made up of fats. Also, fat is incredibly important for the functioning of your immune system. So fat has a huge number of roles to play. And it isn't absorbed directly into your bloodstream following a meal. It's mostly absorbed into your lymphatic system, with the exception of medium chain fats, which almost immediately convert into ketones. Ketones are the energy units of fat. And so fat doesn't really start to get stored until you've consumed so much of it that you've exceeded what you need to replenish and rebuild all those other things. And uh, it has just so many different roles to play in the body, it isn't even funny. Whereas maybe one to two percent maximum of your physical structure is actually comprised of carbohydrate, mostly in the form of glycanutrients and, and connective tissue types of things, you know, glucosamine, chondroitin, things like that. And you don't actually ever have to eat any carbohydrate in order to replenish those structures. You can manufacture all the glucose you need from a combination of protein and fat in your diet. You don't ever have to consume it ever. You know, it's possible to have an amino acid deficiency, you know, protein deficiency. It's possible to have a deficiency of essential fatty acids, but there is no such thing as a deficiency of carbohydrate. Of those three major macronutrients, the only one for which there is no human diet, established human dietary requirement in any medical textbook, in any book of physiology anywhere, is carbohydrate. We don't ever have to eat opposite of the food any. pyramid. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's food pyramid, so uh -huh. no inherent bias there, right? Uh -huh. There is probably nothing that is cheaper to, pr to produce for multinational corporations or more profitable than carbohydrate-based foods. What a boom it is for them because um, there's no way you'll ever make the kind of profit from a grass-fed steak that you can, uh, you know, the 5,000% right. profit that you can make from a box of cereal. Right. 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 So carbohydrates are dirt cheap to produce. They're addictive. They're highly profitable, and they keep you pretty much perpetually hungry. So how perfect is that for, you know, for industry? And we're talking about big agribusiness. Uh, the number one source use of petroleum right now in the world is for big agribusiness. So it's clearly the petroleum industry is also handsomely profiting from all of this. The food industry is you know, cleaning up. You know, the weight loss industries are, are, are cleaning up. And I'd say, you know, undertakers are also doing a bang-up job, you know. <laughs> the rest of us are, are, are fat and sick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The only people profiting from that way of eating are the people, you know, are the industries yeah. that, that promote this way of eating. Um, but you and I, on the other hand, don't do so well. Of course, I'm a proponent of something called the paleo diet, which is looking at diet and health from kind of an evolutionary perspective. What have we eaten as a species for the last close to three million years? Um, what kinds of foods actually established our physiological makeup and our nutritional requirements? And it turns out through the vast majority of our evolutionary history, we've been, you know, hunter-gatherers, but primarily hunters, mm -hmm. relying on meat and especially the fat of the animals that we hunted, not just to give us a lot of nutrient-dense energy to survive, but those very foods were actually responsible for building the kind of brain that we have now which is only maybe 2 to 5% of our actual body mass, but actually, you know, and I, I like to make the joke a little less if you happen to be a politician, but it actually, you know, uses 20 to 30% of your total energy supply to keep itself running. And if you're a baby, you're actually running roughly 75% of your energy off of fats. You know, you, you have, your brain requires 75% of your body's energy which I would imagine a healing brain would also require more Big time. energy. And that's why yes. we have so much fatigue. Right. Because it's just, uh, yeah. Sugar and sugar is inflammatory. Sugar and starch are inflammatory. Fat is not, if it is the right kind of fat. In other words, healthy natural fat from naturally fed sources. When you go out and you get the meat from an animal that has been allowed to forage naturally, either it's it's wild meat, wild game, or it's, or it's a cow that has lived on nothing but fresh green grass its entire life, right up until the time it wound up on your plate. You will have as much uh, or more omega-3 in that meat than you might get in, in uh, you know, gram for gram in a piece of wild caught fish, which is kind of extraordinary. That's where we got all the omega-3s that, that built our big brains, was from the fat of the animals that we hunted. So 
those kinds of fats were really what were responsible for forging the brain that we have now. And then around the, you know, we, we developed agriculture only about 10,000 years ago or so. And in the last 10,000 years, we've actually lost just over 10% of our brain volume. And the big change was going from a 90% diet, a diet that was 90% uh, fat and meat and fat to a diet that is 90% grains and legumes and these new foods. Which are shrinking our brains. Which are shrinking our brains literally. Which we, we can't afford if we already have compromised brains. That's right. Yeah. Right. So essentially, you know, kind of said in very basic terms, you're proposing that for healthy brains, we need to eat less carbohydrates. We need to get the bagels and cookies out of the brain injury support groups, which yes. they're always there. Right. Sodas, cookies, and bagels, cakes. Right. And bring in more fruits and vegetables. Well, I'd say less fruits, actually, less because fruits. fruit, fruit, the, the sugar in fruit is largely fructose, which mm -hmm. is highly potentially glycating. You know, so much depends, too, on how compromised you are. Mm -hmm. But if you're compromised, then I would actually leave off the fruits and maybe maybe stick to you know a handful of blueberries here and there. I mean, berries have the most potential benefits of all of the fruit, and they're also closest to our you know to what we would have consumed in the wild mm -hmm. of all the fruit. Our ancestors, you know, the kind of fruit that we find in the in the cultivated fruits in the orchards and in the grocery store aisles today. They're not bred for their nutritional content. They're bred for their size and their sweetness. If you go out in the woods and you look for fruit, what do you find? You find things that are much smaller, much more fibrous, much more tart. It, they're available on a very limited basis, you know, seasonally. And, you know, we would have consumed them in places where they were available seasonally as a way of fattening up for the winter. So I'm imagining a lot of people are going to think that, you know, by eating a lot of vegetables and some protein and some animal fat and not having any carb on their dinner plate that they're going to be left hungry. Well, I get plenty of carb, but in the form of fibrous vegetables and greens, right? So and and I actually think green. that, well, like broccoli and asparagus and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and, you know, spinach and kale and, um, you know, there, there's just such a huge variety of, of fibrous plant-based foods that aren't starchy, you know, to choose from. And I actually think that these foods are probably more important to us now than they ever used to be uh, way back when, just simply by virtue of the fact that they, they can be very detoxifying, you know, mm -hmm. they can have a detoxification effect, in addition to the fact that they contain a lot of phytonutrients and antioxidants that can help us combat a lot of the pollutants and compounds that, that challenge us you know, in modern times, things that our ancestors couldn't have even begun to have fathomed right. in their time. And so the hunger is more satiated by the fat that you're eating in your diet. Absolutely. Fat is the great satiator in the human diet, um, which is why when you're eating a fat-based diet, it sounds like you'd be eating more calories. In the end, you actually end up eating probably less. Number one, because you're not feeling the need to eat constantly, but also because fat's inherently satiating. The rich foods kind of are sort of self-limiting. Most people don't binge on butter, right? Um, or, or steak or whatever, you know, you eat so much and then it's kind of like, okay, I've had, I've had enough. When you're eating nutrient-dense food that way, that has a lot of nutrients that your body is designed to make use of, again, you know, we, we're not designed to make optimal use of plant foods. We don't have four stomachs, you know, we don't have a bacterial-based digestion uh, the way herbivores do. Ours is a hydrochloric acid-based digestion, so we're best designed to make use, and also because we have tremendous energy demands with our brains, most of us. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, for us, we make the best use of, of animal source foods, but plant source foods are, are perfectly fine, and I think a wonderful supplement to that um, for a variety of reasons that I just mentioned. And, you know, nuts and a few seeds here and there, and, um, you know, the occasional handful of berries, you know, blueberries have some, you know, you know, polyphenols and in them, whatever, that seem to show some, some benefit for the brain. So that's, especially wild blueberries, um, seem to be particularly rich in those compounds. It is surprisingly satisfying way to eat. And once you've metabolically made the switch over to relying on fat instead of sugar as your primary source of fuel, you find that not only your moods and your energy and your, your cognitive functioning and everything else even out, but you also find that you're not craving the stuff you used to anymore because you're not dependent on that fuel anymore.
So your body isn't demanding. Right? And so I used to love bread. I used to love desserts. And now I just sort of look straight through it when it's sitting on a table, you know, in front of me in a restaurant or something like that, or the dessert tray goes by. I don't have an attitude of, oh, well, I shouldn't. You just sort of lose interest because you just, you don't need it. It's, it's very liberating. It's an enormously liberating thing to do. And, uh, you know, a fat-based ketogenic approach to eating, again, it, it is profoundly stabilizing for the brain. It is anti-inflammatory. It dampens free radical activity, which is part of what does damage to the brain. It enhances the effect of antioxidant activity. It improves levels of, of an important enzyme called glutathione in your hippocampus, which is the first part of the brain to deteriorate in conditions like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. There are so many health enhancing effects that it's kind of ridiculous when you start to look at the list of all of the diseases and conditions and symptoms that radically improve on that type of dietary approach. There's really no downside. There are really only benefits to be gotten and why wait until you're sick in order to, to reap those benefits. And if you happen to be suffering from the instabilities associated with a traumatic brain injury, this will be the greatest possible foundational gift you can give yourself. I'm not saying there isn't more that you can do. There, there are definitely other things you can do, but this is foundational. Yeah, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. So, and you mentioned Alzheimer's too. So it sounds like by shifting our diets from a sugar-based diet to a fat-based diet, um, that not only are we helping each other in the immediate present cognitive day-to-day -day functioning, yes. but we're Down reducing our risk of getting Alzheimer's, which is increased for people with brain injury yes. down the road, and none of us want to go down that double whammy. Right. Absolutely. So. Again, Alzheimer's disease is being, is being viewed now as basically a form of brain neuropathy, like a brain-based diabetic condition, where your brain is not losing its ability to make use of sugar as a primary source of fuel. It's no longer responding to that, and as a result, because the brain can't energize itself, it starts to die off. If you switch its dependence over to fat as a primary source, to ketones specifically, which, which is what the brain uses almost exclusively, then suddenly you've given your brain something that it can't become resistant to. And you've, you've improved its, its regular access to something that every human body has more than enough of to keep that energy level going. It's not only being seen as a potential preventative for things like Alzheimer's, it's also being seen as a viable treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Researchers like George Cahill and Richard Beach have done you know, enormous amounts of research in this area. There's a book that, that came out called uh, Alzheimer's, What If There Was a Cure, I believe it is. It was written by a medical doctor by the name of Mary Newman, whose husband was diagnosed with advanced Alzheimer's. And the conventional approaches to Alzheimer's weren't touching his condition. He was deteriorating rapidly, and she was growing almost equally rapidly disillusioned with the mainstream medical approach to that condition and began doing her own research, stumbled across some of the work of Cahill and Beach and, and, and realized that she could switch her husband's diet over to a more fat-based diet and get the sugar and the starch out of it as a way of giving his brain a new type of fuel and found that it, it radically turned him around. And there are diagrams in, in the book that show you know, really dramatic changes within even just a couple of weeks. Wow. Now, my own mother is, is dying from Alzheimer's disease. And I can't think of a more cruel way to leave this world than to watch everything that you have ever become in this life disintegrate, like slip away like sand through your, finger, through your fingers. The amount of suffering experienced and the, and the loss of dignity is something beyond anything I would wish on um, even my worst enemy. I just, I can't imagine. And um, I was able to visit her finally, uh, you know, a few short weeks ago, and got to go through her kitchen and see what was there. And it was, there was more bread and cookies and things like that than I, than I even expected to find. I was really pretty stunned. And she had always been fat phobic, which was not a good thing either. And so, uh, and you know, she had margarine in the fridge that went into the into the um, garbage can really fast. And I basically loaded up 
shopping bags full of all of the, you know, all of the carbs, all of the gluten, because again, that immune reactivity to gluten is also highly correlated with the white matter lesions that are seen in Alzheimer's disease. There, there can definitely be an autoimmune component to this disease. So I, I got rid of all of that stuff and, and, and replaced it with high quality uh, protein from grass-fed meats and, and things like that, and uh, really high quality fats, um, and everything from really good quality olive oil and duck fat and coconut oil, which is, coconut oil is especially good. And this was the thing that Mary Newport used with her husband because the medium chain fats in coconut oil go directly into your portal blood, that they're unique that way. Most fats go absorb, absorb through the lymphatic system. Medium chain fats go right into the portal blood and are almost immediately converted into ketones. That once the brain is, is looking for that new energy source, can latch on to and start to use very quickly. And so uh, coconut oil is a great thing, great thing to add uh, to the diet. Really important, actually. It's a great way also to make that transition more quickly. And, and so, how much coconut oil are we talking about? Like a couple tablespoons a day or? Oh, that would be bare minimum. Really? I, mean, I would just be adding it to whatever. Dietary fat doesn't make you fat, only in the presence of carbohydrates, you know. And again, insulin is the fat storage hormone. Insulin is not generated by dietary fat. It is generated particularly through uh, the presence of dietary carbohydrate through dietary sugar and starch. Uh, coconut oil has also demonstrated potential effects of enhancing thyroid function and, and things of that nature, and people tend to actually become leaner uh, with high levels of coconut oil in the diet rather than the other way around. You can't store it as body fat. You can't store it as medium chain fats as body fat. So they get used preferentially for energy. Day, and you can have as Very much as you want, just keep adding it to Yes. Your smoothies, your yes. stir fries. Yep. Cooking, cooking your food in, in them, you know, all that sort of thing. Very, very beneficial. There are also medium chain triglyceride oils, and you can buy those in any health food store. And those are also extremely useful. There's, you know, some are better than others, but, but it's, it's a good thing to add to the mix. And again, you become increasingly efficient over time at starting to make use of those ketones that you're producing. Initially, people will start to produce lots and lots of ketones, but they're not necessarily using them right away. Um, that's when people buy those urinary strips, you know, that they to check oh, yeah. ketone levels. That was really big with the Atkins diet. It's actually kind of a, a dumb way of measuring ketones because it doesn't tell you anything about what you're using. And interestingly, in the early stages of adopting a more fat-based ketogenic approach, you'll, you're shedding ketones like crazy. It doesn't mean that you're using them yet, right? And once you actually start to use them, suddenly the urinary ketones start to go away. And you think, well, I'm not in ketosis anymore. And it doesn't actually measure effective ketosis at all. In fact, it's only measuring a form of ketone called acetoacetate, which isn't really the kind that your body's using anyway. So uh, the primary ketone your brain uses is beta-hydroxybutyrate, and those, those things don't measure that. You can get a blood ketone meter to measure more effective levels of ketones. But there's a new one, and again, I don't have a financial stake in this at all. It's, it's uh, I believe it's made overseas, a company called Ketonics, and that's a breath ketone meter, and you can use that. Uh, it'll plug right into any USB port, and you can use it over and over and over again to see what your levels of ketones are, whether you're, so you can kind of see what you're getting from what you're doing as you're trying to adapt to this way of eating and see when you're effectively there and when you're not. It's like, whoops, you know, I, I slipped and ate that banana an hour ago, and now I'm not in ketosis anymore, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of a thing. Uh, or I ate that baked potato with dinner, and shoot, now it's been, you know, I've, it's been a couple days, and I'm having a hard time getting back into effective ketosis again. You start to learn what works and what doesn't. Um, but then you get a measurable effect. And sometimes people do well with that structure. You know, it's helpful. So... In summarizing, what would be the nutritional advice of what we should eat and what we shouldn't eat if we've got a traumatic brain injury? Minimize your intake of sugar and starch. I would eliminate, I would just get off of post-agricultural foods. I'd get off of grains and legumes because they contain compounds that are more likely to cause you problems than they are to benefit your health in any way. They're much more likely to compromise your brain than support it. So I would just get off of that. Think in terms of what would have looked like food to somebody wandering around 40,000 years ago wearing a loincloth and a spear, right? Or a pair of mucklucks, as it were. 
eat as much protein as your body requires, but don't exceed that if you can, if you can help it. In other words, most people don't need more than maybe six or seven ounces of meat or fish or eggs or whatever in an entire day. So this is actually a rather inexpensive way to eat when it comes right down to it, because the most expensive thing is protein. When we consume protein in excess of what we actually need to effect our metabolic repair and maintenance, what we're actually doing is causing our body to try to make more new cells, because it's a really good time to start reproducing and making more stuff, right? And also, you, your body will take excess protein that it doesn't need for structure and convert it into sugar and use it the same way. And we're trying to minimize our intake and production of sugar wherever we can. So by eating just as much as you need to get by, and it can be steak, it can be, you know, organ meats are wonderful. Those are really wonderful nutrient-dense food and very affordable. Um, it can be, you know, fish, seafood, uh, eggs, things of that nature, but just not not too much. And then you add as much fat to that as you need to in order to satisfy your appetite. And then you can add as many fibrous vegetables and greens, eat them raw, eat them cooked, eat them cultured or fermented, you know, those, those homemade krauts and things that are really quite wonderful for you and have more nutrition than the vegetables that those, that, that those foods came from. Um, a few nuts and seeds along the way, you know, and stay away from the fake fats, stay away from margarine and vegetable shortening, stay away from refined vegetable oils. Those are very new to us. Our ancestors wouldn't have taken a sunflower seed and mashed it up and fried up a woolly mammoth steak in that. They might have eaten the seed if they'd have come across it, but you know, those, those oils are really new to us as a species. We weren't designed to eat them, and they're higher in inflammatory omega-6s. So the seed oils that are really popular in the, the commercial blends of vegetable oils and things like that are really, really, really high in the, in the inflammatory kinds of fats that we more so need to worry about and the kinds that are more likely to go bad in our body and stick to our arteries and, and clog them up. It's not saturated fat and cholesterol that, that plaque your arteries. It's, it's rancid, unsaturated and polyunsaturated fats that do that. And it's, it's, you know, that's, been, that's published research. Thank you so much for all this You're fantastic welcome. information. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for being here, Nora. I, it's my pleasure. Hey guys, I hope you found my contribution towards this video useful and valuable because now it's your turn. And what I want to do is I want to hear from you. And I want to keep all of our experiences, the science and the research about this topic regarding traumatic brain injury in one place. And that's going to be in the comment section below on the YouTube channel. So what I would love is I would love for you to go to the YouTube channel itself, not the Facebook page, but the YouTube channel so they're all kept in one place. And tell us your experience regarding this topic. Did it, was it helpful for you? Was it not helpful for you? And if you have any science or any research regarding this topic, I would love for you to post the links there too. So together we can raise our voices for traumatic brain injury awareness and educate the professionals that are helping us. Together we can do this. So thank you so much for being my partner and thank you so much for putting your valuable contribution to this project.